Okay, so let me just zoom in. Okay, so in problem number three, there's a lot of words, but it's not, don't, get, don't, don't be mistaken by the words. It's just pretty much describing the picture that you're seeing there. Okay, so we have five meter long section of air heating system of a house that passes through an unheated space in the basement, right? So that's the first mistake of this engineer because we have an air system, think about all this air duct going through the rooms and the living room and all that. And at some point it has to go through the basement for whatever reason. But as soon as it goes through the basement, the basement is colder than the rest of the house. And then the thing is gonna lose some energy to the basement um, because it's unheated. Um, the cross section of the rectangular duct of heating is 20 by 25 centimeters. Hot air enters the duct at 100 kilopascals and 60 degrees Celsius at an average velocity of five meters per second. The density of air at 60 is 1.045. Six and the temperature of the air duct after it passes through the heat loss in the basement is 54 Celsius. The constant pressure specific heat of air at the average temperature of 57 is 0 0.11, oh, sorry, 0 0.007. And we're gonna talk about, that's why I highlighted that. Assuming that steady operation condition exists and the air can be treated as an ideal gas with constant properties at room temperature, determine the rate of heat loss from the air in the duct in the basement under steady conditions. So there's heaps of things for us to talk about. The question itself is quite simple, but the things to learn from it are important. The first thing is notice that if you guys recall, CP is a function, is a function of temperature. Okay, so that means that at 60, we're gonna have one CP, at 100, we're gonna have a different CP. Then what we use to counter that is we use average temperature or bulk temperature. That's an engineering tool, let's put it that way. Because if you're trying to get a precise value off of this, you're gonna to have to integrate, you're gonna find what's the behavior of CP as it's going from 60 to 54, integrate between the intervals and try to find precisely the value of CP for that interval, okay? So we have to have several iterations and sum them up afterwards to see what's the heat transfer. But as engineers, what we use most of the time is we just get an average. Okay, so in other words, what we have there is a little function, we have CP over here, we have temperature over here, and we have a value for 54, which is tabled, and we also have a value for 60, which is tabled, right? And then we have those two CPs. So if we went from one to the other, this is gonna change, and we don't know, we do, but we don't, we're not, don't really care whether it goes like that, whether it goes like that, or whether it goes like that. Okay, what we do is we get, we just do a lin linear interpolation, just grab the two, put them together, grab the mid value, and we say this value that we get off the table for the mid range is close enough to whatever behavior this guy has. So we grab that average temperature there. So we do the average between 54 and 60, you grab the 57, and then we use CP for 57. That is going to be, for the purpose of this unit, that's always going to be okay. You can always do that. For the purpose of field work, when you're doing a field work, it depends on how much accuracy you want to have. I'd say for most cases, like 90% of the cases, you can use this, but depending on what you're dealing with, you might want to do the um, other way. Next thing, assuming steady state operation condition exists, what is that saying, okay? I want you guys to imagine this house, imagine, you can imagine your house and you have this duct that's going through and heating your house, and then it goes through the basement and just loses some energy to the basement. What will happen over time is because, theoretically, if this basement is gaining this energy, its temperature would rise, right? So let's picture that this basement is at 10 Celsius. And as it's receiving this energy, and this energy is coming from this Q loss over here, as it's receiving this energy, the temperature will rise to 11 and then 12, and then eventually, I don't know, 20 Celsius. Okay? Once that happens, because the difference in temperature from the hot air that's going through the duct and the basement has changed, the Q is going to be different now, right? Because we know Q is depending on the difference in temperature. So steady state conditions, which is what we're assuming in this case, is assuming that the temperature of the basement will not change. And that is fine for a lot of situations, okay? So imagine that your basement is losing a lot of heat. So whatever Q loss is going from the duct is also being lost in the basement to somewhere else, to the outside the environment. So if it's at 10 Celsius, after infinite time elapses, it's still gonna be at 10 Celsius. That what, that's what steady state condition means, okay? So in other words, the temperature is not dependent on time. If a, a, thousand time, a thousand hours go by, the interest of the hot air is still 60, the exit of the hot air is still 54, and the temperature of the basement is still 10 or whatever temperature that is. That's a concept that we're gonna be exploring a lot in the, um, 
first four to five weeks. And then we're gonna look at other possibilities when it does change, okay? So what do we need to do here? We need to find out what is a Q loss. And then you can see, check out, you can see there's a dot here already. So they want us to find Q dot, the rate of change in energy. So that means we already know that we're gonna have mass flow rate, CP and delta T. Delta T, 62.54, that's six, easy. CP, we've been given, and that is uh, 1.007, easy. The only thing we don't have is a mass flow rate. So if we find the mass flow rate for this problem, we find we've solved the problem. To find the mass flow rate, we're obviously gonna use these conditions that are given here, right? Check out, the thing is coming in at five meters per second, and it's going through this rectangular duct here, right? So this guy here has, what is it, 25, by 20, so let's do it here, 25 by 20. It's 25 by 20. And I have air that's going through this guy downwards in this case at five meters per second. And we know that if we have this perpendicularity happening, right, we can calculate the volume flow rate by multiplying the velocity in the area, right? As long as it's perpendicular to the area, we can do that straight off the bat. If we can find that, we're gonna find a volume flow rate. And if we find a volume flow rate, we can convert that back into a mass flow rate and use that mass flow rate in our equation, which is exactly what we want, right? If we have a volume flow rate and we also have the density, we can relate the density and the volume flow rate to the mass flow rate and our job is done, okay? So the math behind this is gonna be quite simple. So let's start by calculating our volume flow rate. Put velocity so we don't get confused. Bill for velo uh, the whole thing. Velocity, so no one's confused, times the area, the cross-sectional area in this case. Okay, in this case here, our velocity is five meters per second, and our area is gonna be 25 times 10 to the minus two meters, times 20 times 10 to the minus two meters. Okay, so what we get out of this guy is a volume flow rate, right? and that's 0 0.25 meters cubed per second. That's the volume flow rate that's going through this duct at the entrance before it leaves on the 54 Celsius on the other side. Now the density, if you guys recall, we just looked at that relationship between mass and volume. And that means that if I integrate, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna do that little integration on this side here. Oops, no mass flow rate, just mass rate. Right, if I integrate, if I derive, not integrate, if I derive both sides by the time, right, we take the derivative in respect to time over here and the derivative in respect to time over here, the density does not change with time, right? It doesn't matter how much time elapses, the density of air is gonna be the same. So that means that my volume flow rate, how my volume changes with time, is related by, to my mass flow rate by the density. Okay, so another way of writing this, again, if you like to dot way better, is like this. Okay, and what we can do is simply get this guy here and sub it in here. Right, so our Q loss will be density times the volume flow rate times the CP times the delta T. And guess what? We have everything. We have density and that is, uh, what was it? 1.046. So that's 1.046 kilograms meters cubed. We have the volume flow rate, which is 0 0.25. We have CP, 0 1.007. And we have the difference in temperature, which is 6 Kelvin or Celsius being a difference in temperature. So my Kelvin goes away, meters cubed go away my kilograms go away and I'm left with kilojoules per second, which is the same thing as watts. And I get 1.58 kilojoules per second or kilowatts. All right, so as I said, the, the question itself is not, Hard. The, the math behind it, and it's not supposed to be hard, it's more, these things are more to get 
you guys thinking on the right mindset from now on any questions <laughs>